Amen. Okay, friends, well, go ahead and open your notes. If you're online, you can, of course, um, access notes at the, on the YouVersion app or at our website, uh, fcc-cookville.org, on the sermons page. Encourage you to follow along. And, um, oh, I'm excited about this today. This is, this is going to be good. Real quick, before uh, Josh and, and Carter shared those two just wonderful messages with us, let me kind of re- refresh your memory. We, we've, we've done three weeks in Revelation so far. We did an introduction laying out some principles that are important for us to keep in mind, and I'll remind us of those as we go through. We looked at chapter one, the vision of Jesus glorified in heaven, standing so uh, starkly un- different from the suffering servant that we see in the Gospels, and the glorified Jesus is who's going to return, and how exciting it is to know that, uh, that, that uh, he's coming back for us. And then we looked at the letters in chapters two and three that Jesus dictates to the seven churches, seven, of course, being a, a number that, that tips us off, the number of completeness that lets us know these letters are for the whole church in all generations. And in those letters, Jesus reminds us that he sees everything. He sees our hurts. He sees our struggles. He sees our challenges. He he sees our faithfulness and our service. He also sees those areas where maybe we've grown lukewarm or lost sight of our first love or those areas where we need to be reminded and exhorted to turn afresh to him and stay faithful to the end. Powerful letters. Next week, we're going to look at Revelation chapter 4, this incredible, glorious vision of worship in heaven. It's like a snapshot of what happens 24-7 in heaven. And we're reminded that whatever's going on down here, everything's perfectly in control in the control room in heaven. It's awesome. But today, we're going to ask this question, so what about the rapture? Now, I'm going to make an assumption that we've all heard of the rapture. Right? It's kind of hard to live in American church culture and not heard of the rapture. Um, but if you haven't, that's, that's fine. That's, that's fine. You're going you're gonna to hear a lot about it today. Uh, you're going to understand some things about it today. But specifically, I'm going to kind of hone in and spend the first part of the message anyway on something called the pre-tribulation rapture. Don't, if those are, is that, that's kind of a phrase that confuses you, don't worry, you, you'll get it today. Uh, you'll understand it. And the reason I want to focus on that is because that is in just head and shoulders above, there's many views, there's many views of this, but this is the dominant, most popular view of the rapture, and, and I think it's important for us to consider it through the lens of Scripture and, and really understand, you know, whether it's something we want to hold on to or not. Um, it's important how you understand this, this topic. Because the way you understand the rapture has an effect on how you think as you navigate life. It has an effect and impact on the way you live and how you respond to history as it unfolds before you. In terms of where you put your hope and what you're thinking and, and, and how you'll deal with things as they come. So it's a really important topic for us to get a good biblical understanding of. Having said that, if when I finish today you go, I think Brad's all wet on this, I think he's wrong. Uh, guess what? This isn't a salvation issue. This is a doctrine that's important for our Christian living, but it's your relationship and knowledge of, in terms of relational knowledge with Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior that's the salvation issue. But, but it's just important to kind of say that. Now, early on in my Christian walk, I, I even mentioned this in the intro, I was, I was kind of confronted with all kinds of pre-tribulation rapture teaching and doctrine. I heard it a lot. I didn't quite get it. Uh, there's a lot of lingo with it. Eschatology, end times, you know, dispensationalism, all this stuff. Don't worry, there's no test. You don't have to know those words, but there's all these words. And so I, I thought, and I, I just praise the Lord, he gave me the good sense to just kind of hit the pause button and say, okay, 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 I hear all this stuff. If it's, I'm just going to continue to live my life and study, and I'm just going to continue to read the scriptures and, and prepare and, and, and go to school and, and, and serve the best I can. And if this is a doctrine that is 
clearly taught in Scripture, I'm sure I'll encounter it. So I continued to study and read and serve and live, and it never came up. I never found it. And then, just a few years back, I I was serving at the First uh, Church of Christ in Altoona, PA, as a a, a small groups pastor, and we're doing small groups at a restaurant there in in Altoona, PA, with my buddies. It was a men's group. And Tim, my friend, he loved Revelation, and he loved this particular view. And uh, we're studying Revelation, we get to chapter 4. And this is why I'm dropping the, the message in at this point in the series, because it was chapter 4, verse 1. And we're reading through that first verse. And Tim stops everything. He goes, that's it. I'm like, that's what? That's the rapture right there. I'm like, what? what? It really confused me. Here's the verse we were reading. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door... Standing open in heaven, and the voice that I had heard, or that I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. And he said, Come up here! There it is! I'm like, What? I mean, yeah, John was caught up to heaven and had a vision of heavenly things. Paul was caught up to the third heaven and had a vision of heavenly things. But, but anyway, he had all this elaborate things that he went into, and I was like, wow, dude, you're working really hard to convince me of this thing. And uh, I was like, no, no, I just, it just didn't, didn't, didn't ring true to the Holy Spirit inside of me anyway. And uh, so here's a simple scenario of how this teaching kind of unfolds. And, and if you've ever watched any of the movies or whatever, you probably are going to be like, oh, yeah, I've seen this a thousand times. Uh, we're going through our day. We wake up. It's a normal day. It's a beautiful day, sunny day. And uh, we're just going about our business when, bam, countless Christians all around the world just disappear. Planes crash because the pilots were Christians. Bus drivers run off, or buses run off the road. Surgeries, heart surgeries by by doctors who love the Lord, they're over. Everything, Christians are just gone, and chaos ensues around the world. Followed, following that moment, this time of, Tribulation comes into the world worldwide. Greater and unlike anything that anyone has ever experienced. And during this time of tribulation is when the beast and all of these figures rise up. Anybody heard any of that before? Okay. So that that is the predominant, very popular view. And that's why it's called the pre, as in before. Tribulation, as in a time of suffering. Rapture, as in we get, not, we get to skip the tribulation and rapture it out. Okay, so I got three really big problems with that view. Okay, and, and I don't know if these will hit you the way they hit me, but I want to present them to you. I want you to think about this. Uh, number one, it's almost exclusively... A Western civilization view. Okay? In other words, America and parts of Europe. Uh, the Western culture is, is where this is popular. Now, any popularity it has in any of parts of the world is because of missionaries from the West who have you know, planted this in other parts of the world. Another way of saying is Christians in Asia, Christians in India, Christians in the Middle East. In other words, Christians anywhere in the world where they're actually experiencing tribulation right now do not hold this view at all. That's, I think, significant. The people who hold this view are generally people who have read Revelation with a cup of tea, studying it and going, oh, I think I see some stuff here. Okay, now now, just hold on to that. Um, The second problem that I have with this view is it totally ignores the mean mint rule. Now you might remember the mean mint rule is a rule of interpretation. It's a basic rule that says a scripture can't mean something and we shouldn't try to make it mean something. It never meant. 
In other words, when you study the Bible, one of your, your first steps before you teach anything is to take the time to dig down and find out what did this author, what, did they, what were they trying to say to this audience in that context? Once I understand that original message, then I can begin to draw some application for us today from it. This view completely bypasses that mindset. And so what, it, what you end up with is this subjective disconnected doctrine that would have meant no sense to the first century church. Can you imagine John? He didn't write this in the letter, by the way. But can you imagine if a section of Revelation said, hey, so sorry that your uncle was fed to a lion and Sally was boiled in oil and, and, and I know your friend just had his head removed and... And you all are incredibly being tortured for your faith unto death. But don't worry. In 2,096 years, there's going to be a rapture and that generation gets to miss it. Does that make any sense? Okay, so, so this is why the mean mint rule is important. We've got to understand these things in context. The third problem it's a very new doctrine. It's new. Relatively speaking, historically, it's very new. Uh, 1830s is when this thing came about. Now, now, I want you to ponder and think about this. That means for 1,800 years, the church didn't teach this. Paul didn't teach this. Peter didn't teach this. John didn't teach this. It's not in the apostles' teaching. That's significant. That ought to turn on some light bulbs. But in 1830-ish, there was a man named John Nelson Darby, and he was a Plymouth Brethren preacher, and he was very influential, and he was attending this, this gathering where he encountered a vision by a lady named Margaret MacDonald. And in Margaret's vision, she foresaw two returns of Jesus. The first one being an invisible one. Nobody sees Jesus on his first return. He just comes down close enough to rapture the church out. And everybody's gone. Followed by a time of terrible tribulation. This is all part of her vision. Followed by a time of terrible tribulation. And then a second return of Jesus where every eye will see him like the scriptures describe. The trumpet will sound. The voice of the archangel will shout. The dead in Christ will rise, will receive glorified bodies, and it's beautiful. Um, John Darby was very taken with this vision, and he, again, was very influential, and he began to work with this and write about this and preach about this. And over the course of the 1830s, this view became very popular, and it became known as the pre-tribulation rapture. More recently, authors, many, many people have written and, and talked about this and taught this, and there's been a whole end times movement and all kinds of stuff, all built on this teaching. But more recently, there have been some authors like Hal Lindsey, I mentioned him in the introduction, who wrote this book that totally flipped my mom out in the 70s. I just remember as a kid when she was reading it, and it, it you know, I'm a, I'm a kid and it scared me too, like crazy. Late, great planet Earth. And... Um, it was very popular. It sold over 35 million copies over the course of the 70s. That's, that's a big deal. A little later, around the mid-90s, 1995, a group or a couple guys named Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins, they got together and wrote this series of books, 16 books called Left Behind. Maybe you've heard of some of those. Maybe you've read some of those. Maybe you've seen some of the movies. Great movies. Enter entertaining movies based on this whole notion of a pre-tribulation rapture. Very popular, sold over 65 million copies. Again, in the West, predominantly in the United States. That's just so important to kind of see all that. Now, in my view, I, I believe the Holy Spirit speaks to all of us, of course, but, but it, it just rings true in, in my study of the Word. I, I believe with all my heart that Darby and, and these other 
believers' views on this subject, they're just textbook cases of what's called eisegesis and proof texting. Eisegesis is when you come to a view influenced by something outside of Scripture, like a vision. And you, you are encountered with this view, and you hold on to it, and you embrace it. And then you go to the Bible and start looking for phrases and verses. And generally, you end up needing to jump all over the Bible to pull phrases and verses in to make it kind of make sense. Like, come up here. And you kind of make the Bible say what you want it to say. And then when you add news headlines from newspapers and in, in, in more recent times from you know, news sites on, online. You say, oh, here's a headline, and here's a headline, and, and this verse in Daniel, and this verse in Ezekiel, and look, if we bring it all together, it means Jesus is coming back in 2027 at 3 o'clock. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to make light or fun, but it sort of, I can't help it. Um, it's just one of those views that when you stop and process it and think, okay, how does that fly with the first century church? It doesn't. How does that fly with Christians in Asia and in India who are being persecuted unto death today? It doesn't. That's just so important, friends, for us, I think, to really get a grip on. So obviously, I just, I just don't think that's the right view. So does the Bible teach about a rapture? Does the Bible teach about a time when we're caught up? Oh, yeah. Praise God, yes. Fantastically, beautifully. One of the most clear teachings on this is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. Where Paul says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and with the voice of the archangel. By the way, this is not a silent, quiet, invisible return. The shout of the archangel and the trumpet's uh, call of God. Um, yeah, the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ that is, those who have lived their lives faithfully following Christ and who have passed away, those bodies, this is the resurrection that the Scriptures talk about when it says that Jesus is the first to be born from among the dead, the first fruits of those who have been resurrected. This is the resurrection it's talking about that will be raised. The dead in Christ will rise. And after this, we who are still alive, if there are any of us alive at that moment... Uh, we will be caught up together with them in the clouds and we will meet the Lord in the air and so we will be with the Lord forever. Praise God. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is fantastic that there's a day when the Lord will come and set all things straight. But this is not a pre-tribulation rapture. This is that day. This is the day of the Lord. This is the time when it all gets wrapped up and the Lord returns. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. I'm just going to give you some references here. If you're taking notes, write these down. You can read them. Uh, but I just want to quickly mention something here for time's sake. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. In both of those passages, Paul teaches so clearly that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That when we pass physically, these physical bodies die, our spirit goes to be with Jesus. Praise God. That's why at Christian funerals, there's hope. Because we know there's our loved one's body, but they're not home anymore. That body's going to go to the ground and await the resurrection. That is coming, but their spirit is with Jesus. 
That's beautiful. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 10. Jude chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, and others, but those clearly teach that at the end. The Lord will return with His saints. With all those beautiful spirits and the hosts of heaven, they will return. And it's at this time that we have this bodily resurrection that Paul talks about so at length in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And these, our spirits are reunited with glorified bodies. I need a glorified body. <laughs> I'm ready. Anybody got eggs? I'm, I'm, I'm like having this talk with Gary Yockers, and it's like, I, I went, this, 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 this weekend was awesome, but I was, we're standing on this concrete floor for like 10 hours on both days, and I'm looking at Brent, and I'm like, I don't think I can stand any longer. I'm like getting neuropathy in my legs. I got to sit down, man. Because this, are you 18? Let's do it, man. All day. I'm like, these old bodies just don't, they just don't live forever. You know? But glorified bodies, what a day that will be. And it's at this time that the new creation is ushered in. The old creation is gone. Satan and death are cast into the lake of fire along with those whose names are not in the Lamb's book of life. All wrongs are made right. Rewards are offered to God's people for their faithfulness and we are given these glorified bodies and we live with Him and serve with Him and the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven. And we live with, and serve and glorify and, and worship God for eternity. And these glorified bodies that are meant to live forever in a fresh creation. Now that'll be awesome. But the big point today is that there's not a generation that gets a get out of tribulation free card. Okay? Uh, we are all called to be faithful to Jesus until the end. If into death, it, that's what it takes, then unto death. Um, and I personally love that because there's a lot of martyrs spoken of in the Bible, and I don't know, I don't, we don't know, none of us know what history will, what hand it will deal us. In this part of our world, to this point, we have been spared that unto death part. There are many Christian brothers and sisters around the world who have not. But if it comes that, to that here, listen, remember what Jesus said. Do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot touch the soul. And remember this. The day the sky splits and, and, and you return with the, the Lord in your spirit, th there's going to be tremendous reward for those who are faithful. And, and, and I, you know, I, I, don't want to, I don't want anything to come about that re removes my opportunity to be faithful to the end. So no, don't, 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 don't take me out early. Put me in, coach. I want to play to the end. You know? It's beautiful. Let me read Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. To, this is skipping ahead to the end. But it's a great way to, to wrap this up. Talking about the new creation. John says, I, I saw the new heaven. The fresh, refreshed, renewed heaven and uh, the new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth, first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. Friends, it might be worth taking note of this. This is the way God has worked from Genesis 1 all the way through. God came down to Adam and Eve. God came down and called Abraham from his father's household to follow him. God came down to Mount Sinai and gave the law. God came down through his prophets and spoke to his people Israel. God came down through his son Jesus Christ put on flesh and dwelt among us. God came down through his Holy Spirit and walks with us. And 
God in the new Jerusalem will come down to be with us. There's a beautiful sense that we go to be with him in spirit, but the predominant view all the way through the scriptures is that God comes to us. And so that's what we see right here. The new Jerusalem came down out of heaven from God. Listen to this. I love this. Prepared. That is the same word that Jesus uses in John 14 when he said, if I go, I'll go to prepare a place for you. And then later, I'll bring you so that we can be together in that place. Well, it's prepared now in Revelation 21. And here it comes. As a bride, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a voice from the throne saying, and, and, and you got to get it. The guys, these, these exclamation points are on purpose. Look! God's dwelling place is now among the people. This has been his desire all along. Ever since Adam and Eve went... From that moment, he's been looking forward to this one. When we could be reconciled and he could fully be with us. Not just in spirit, but face to face. Face to face. All creation groans for that day. Longs for that day. Look. uh, Now... God is among his people, and he will dwell with them. Look, look at all this with language. They will dwell, he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them, and he will be their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old cursed order of things has passed away. That'll be glorious. What a day that will be. But that begs the question, are you ready for that day? Do you know him? Here's the question I want you to search your heart with this morning. I know you're here, you're at church. Maybe you're watching online. Maybe you're watching online 10 years after this has been put up. I don't know. Are you all in? I mean, have you given it all to Jesus? Are are you, no one knows it, but maybe you're playing a game. Maybe you're painting a smile on and coming. But you're not all in. Friend, I want to encourage you to go all in today. We're going to have a time after uh, Norris is going to come up and lead us in communion. Um, But I just want to encourage you to go all in. Let it all go. Because we may very likely, and even if we're not, it's, it's, it's worth doing, but we may very likely be heading into times when you need to have decided that you're all in before the trouble comes. You know, it's, it's way harder to make the decision to be all in in the midst of the trouble. And, and if you've never given your life to Christ, please come. I'd love to help you take that step today um, so that we can... Because, because for those who are all in, when the trumpet sounds, it's a glorious moment. And for those who don't and aren't, it's the, mo- it's the worst of all moments. So I just pray you'll come and say yes to him today. Or anything else that you need to pray about, I'd love to meet you and share with you and, and, and pray with you. All right, God bless you.